good day dear students now we have a series of two lectures on cardiac output the first lecture is on determinants of stroke volume so this is competency 5.7 according to the framework of the hcf 5 refers to cardiovascular physiology and 7 is this particular competency which uh, describes the factors affecting heart rate and regulation of cardiac output and blood pressure so the learning objectives for the session are that at the end of this lecture you should be able to define the terms stroke volume cardiac output end diastolic volume end systolic volume ejection fraction then you should be able to explain a very important law that is the frank starling's law of the heart not only state the law but explain it then list the determinants of stroke volume explain the role of end diastolic volume in the regulation of uh, stroke volume similarly explain the role of myocardial contractility and afterload or peripheral resistance so what is stroke volume stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped out by the ventricles per beat so whatever the ventricles pump per beat that is the stroke volume so it is 70 ml per beat and what is cardiac output then cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle into the aorta or the right right ventricle into the pulmonary artery per minute it is equal to stroke volume into heart rate so stroke volume being 70 ml and heart rate being between 60 to 100 now you can calculate for yourself the value of normal cardiac output i'll give you about 15 seconds to calculate the value of normal cardiac output Seventy into anything between sixty and hundred. That is the normal value. So seventy ml is the stroke volume, and if we take the normal heart rate to be equal to seventy per minute, then stroke volume, then cardiac output is five liters per minute. and it is what is end diastolic volume it is volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole normal value is 120 ml so then what would be the end systolic volume remember the stroke volume is 70 ml while the volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole is 120 ml so what would be the normal uh, what would be the end systolic volume yes right that is end diastolic volume 120 ml minus stroke volume 70 ml that is the end systolic volume is normally about 40 to 50 ml now the ratio of end stroke volume to end diastolic volume that is 70 by 120 into 100 is known as ejection fraction please remember this ejection fraction is the ratio of stroke volume to end diastolic volume into 100 and its normal value is 60 to 70% in when an echocardiography is done it is an important index of cardiac function so this uh, ejection fraction normally should be uh, between 60 to 70% if it decreases below this so it goes below 50 then it indicates that the heart is not functioning well it is a ratio of stroke volume to end diastolic volume so we have studied a number of terms we have studied stroke volume cardiac output end diastolic volume and systolic volume and, and ejection fraction now we go to frank starling's law of the heart that is the energy of contraction of the cardiac muscle fiber is proportional to the initial fiber length at rest that is the degree of stretch of the ventricles at the end of diastole determines their contractility how much the ventricles are stretched at the end of diastole determines how much each ventricle 
contracts during systole. Now let us understand this. How does increased stress stretch lead to a greater contractile force? This is due to the overlapping between the actin and myosin filaments, which is called the lattice spacing hypothesis. What this means is that when the length of the sarcomere, that is the portion between two successive Z lines is greater than two micrometers, a portion of the cross bridges are pulled in the opposite direction. So this length is not optimal because it then becomes like a tug of war. A portion of the cross bridges are pulled in the opposite direction. And if the sarcomere length is less than 1.6 micrometer, the myosin filament touches the Z line. You can see here, in this case, the myosin filament almost touching the Z line. And in this case, both the a uh, portion of the cross bridges are being pulled in the opposite direction. So this is not optimal. What is optimal is a sarcomere length between 1.6 to 2 micrometers. Therefore, Patterson, Piper and Starling stated this law in 1915 that, that the energy of contraction, the force with which the heart muscle contracts during systole is proportional to the initial fiber length at rest that is at the end of diastole. The force with which the ventricles contract is proportional to the end diastolic volume. How is the Frank Starling's law important? Nicola, is this the right and left ventricular output? Suppose the right ventricular output is 1% greater than the left ventricular output. Suppose it is more by say about 40 ml. Then Pulling of blood would occur in the lungs, causing the pulmonary blood volume to reach two liters within half an hour. So within half an hour, there would be a lot of blood collecting in the lungs and this will increase the pressure within the pulmonary capillaries, what is called the hydrostatic pressure. And that was called exudation of fluid into the lungs, resulting in pulmonary edema. So this pulling of blood in the pulmonary veins increases the pulmonary venous pressure on the contrary and that increases the amount of blood in the left ventricle at the end of diastole and that increases the left ventricular output. So the output of both the right and the left ventricle is then balanced. So we have now studied the Frank Stalling's law that is uh, the force of contraction of the ventricles during systole is proportional to the degree of uh, stretch uh, at the end of diastole or is it proportional to the end diastolic volume. These are the three main factors. Rather than factors, I would use the term determinants, which because they determine the stroke volume that is preload or the end diastolic volume, then the myocardial contractility, the heart as a pump itself, and the afterload or the peripheral resistance. These are the three determinants of stroke volume. And the rest of the lecture will be uh, devoted to uh, understanding these determinants and uh, explaining their role in the regulation of uh, stroke volume. So the filling pressure, that is the end diastolic volume, which is determined by Frank Starling's law of heart, myocardial contractility, and the arterial pressure or the afterload, which opposes ejection, are the main determinants of stroke volume. Again, some terms, that is, what is preload? It is the degree of stretch of the cardiac muscle fibers before they start contracting. That is, before they start contracting, the degree of stretch is called preload. And the preload is determined mainly by the venous return. But the term uh, central venous pressure or pressure in the right atrium is a more appropriate term than venous return. We are not going into these details. For the sake of simplicity, we'll use the term venous return uh, rather than the central venous pressure. 
because most of the books use the term venous return. So it is degree of stretch of the cardiac muscle fibers before they start contracting. And after load, load encountered on the heart muscle after it starts contracting. That is, this after load is the peripheral resistance or uh, the load encountered on the heart muscle after it starts contracting. What is heterometric regulation? It is change in cardiac output due to change in diastolic fiber length. That is, when the preload, the end diastolic volume determines the cardiac output, it is called heterometric regulation. And when change in cardiac output occurs without a change in diastolic fiber length, that is, with a change in myocardial contractility, it is called homometric regulation. So we have studied these terms, stroke volume, that is the amount of blood pumped out by the ventricles per beat, which is 70 ml. Cardiac output, the amount of blood pumped by the ventricles per minute, that is 70 into 70, that is 5 liters per minute. End diastolic volume, that is the amount of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole, that is about 120 ml. End systolic volume, that is about 40 to 50 ml, which is equal to the end diastolic volume minus the stroke volume. And ejection fraction is a ratio of stroke volume to end diastolic volume. It is an important index of cardiac function and it should be between 60 to 70 percent. Preload. What is preload? Preload is the force exerted on the heart muscle before it starts contracting. Then what is afterload? Force exerted on the heart muscle after it starts contracting. What is homometric regulation? That is a change in stroke volume without a change in the length of the muscle fiber. This is change in myocardial contractility. And heterometric regulation is when the end diastolic volume or the preload affects the contractility of the heart. Due to a change in end diastolic fiber length. Finally, Frank Starling's law, that is the ventricular output is proportional to the ventricular end diastolic volume. So you can just summarize what you have learned in 20 seconds. And take a stretch break. During that time, So we now come to the first determinant, the end diastolic volume, uh, which is the preload and the factors which affect the preload or the end diastolic volume. We'll take the story of this police traffic policeman, the tireless traffic policeman who stands in hot weather uh, during the afternoon and throughout the day. So why does the traffic policeman faint if he stands in attention? for a long time in hot weather. So to start, the preload or the end diastolic volume is the amount of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole. And this is, uh, to revisit, it is heterometric regulation. Hetero means that that is, it is not uniform, that is the end diastolic fiber length changes. So one of the factors affecting it is the pumping of the uh, veins, that is the skeletal muscle pump. Now these veins are surrounded by skeletal muscles and when they pump rhythmically, then blood is forced towards the heart, towards the central pool and then towards the heart, increasing the end diastolic volume. Similarly, 
contraction of the abdominal muscles. That is the abdominal pushes more blood towards the heart. When the diaphragm descends, the negative intrathoracic pressure pushes more blood towards the heart and that increases the end diastolic volume. Please remember about two-thirds of the blood is in the venous system. Hence, they are known as the capacitance vessels. But if there is a, say, a road traffic accident and there is hemorrhage or shock, this will decrease the total blood volume and it will decrease the venous return and hence the cardiac output. If somebody is sitting or uh, standing up from a sitting position, then Gravity will shift 500 of blood from the thorax into the limbs. Similarly, sympathetic stimulation such as exercise, stress, deep respiration and shock increase the venous return and hence uh, increase the cardiac output. These are all fight or flight responses as we have studied in previous lectures. So to summarize about venous return, that is the pumping action of the skeletal muscles of the limb increases the venous return. The thoracic and abdominal pump increases the venous return. When the extracellular fluid volume decreases as in dehydration, sweating, then the venous return decreases. So what will happen if a traffic policeman is standing for a prolonged period? The skeletal muscle pump will not function. And the loss of water due to sweating will decrease the extracellular fluid volume. So both these factors will contribute to that extent that the person will faint. So combination of gravitational venous pooling, lack of skeletal muscle pump contraction, and also heat will cause vasodilation. So that will also decrease the venous return. So these factors will result in less blood flowing to the brain, which is called cerebral hypoperfusion. And hence, it will lead to fainting. Now, how to overcome that? The answer to this is that the policeman should move his limbs frequently and drink plenty of water. So that will overcome the, uh, faint, uh, prevent the fainting episodes. Another factor which contributes to the end diastolic volume is the atrial pump activity and the atria function as primer pumps. That is, they contribute only to 20% of the ventricular fluid. So if this is the end diastolic volume, then the atria contribute only 20%. This atrial pump becomes important in exercise or when there is some stress, when there is ventricular compliance. That is, the ability of the ventricular muscle to relax at the end of diastole. The relaxation of ventricles during diastole plays an important role in regulating end diastolic volume. And when there is collection of fluid around the heart as in pericardial effusion, the end diastolic volume is affected because uh, the ability of the ventricles to relax is affected. This limits the end diastolic volume. Now we come to the second determinant that is myocardial contractility. You can take your time to answer this question whether athletes have bradycardia. Is it true or false? So you must have studied in the uh, practicals on pulse examination that athletes do have bradycardia and we are going to answer the question, why do athletes have bradycardia? So when an athlete does physical training, that increases the ventricular muscle mass that increases the ventricular muscle mass. The 
physical training increases the ventricular muscle mass and that increases the stroke volume. So the same amount of cardiac output can be achieved with a lesser heart rate because cardiac output is equal to stroke volume into heart rate. So if the stroke volume say becomes uh, 90 instead of 70, then the heart will have to beat at the rate of 60 or less. And a heart rate of less than 60 is called bradycardia. So athletes have bradycardia because physical training conditioning increases the ventricular muscle mass and increases the stroke volume. Damage to the heart muscle as in myocardial infarction will lead to decrease in ventricular muscle mass and this will decrease in contractility. We'll study what is a heart attack when we uh, have a lecture on coronary circulation. In addition, activation of the sympathetic nervous system will increase myocardial contractility. So stress, fight or fight response will increase myocardial contractility. How will that happen? Through a process known as inotropic effect, that is increase in contractility, and lucitropic effect, that is decreased relaxation time. There are four main effects, inotropic effect, chronotropic effect, bathmotropic effect, and dromotropic effect. In addition, there is a lucitropic effect. Ino means increase in contractility. Chronotropic effect means increase in heart rate. Bathmotropic effect means increase in automicity of the SA node. And when there is increase in conduction to the conducting system, this is known as dromotropic effect. Now, how does this work? So, this is the sarcolemma, this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and this is the actin and myosin filament. You know that the heart muscle requires intracellular calcium to contract. And if the intracellular calcium is more, the heart muscle contracts more as a pump. So when there is sympathetic stimulation, then there will be increased influx of calcium. Also, there will be increased release of calcium through calcium release channels, which are called as rhinodyne receptors. And these in turn will result in increased contractility. Also, a molecule known as phospholamba increases the activity of this sarca, that is the sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, increasing the uptake of calcium and decreasing the relaxation time. So this is the activity of phospholamba, increasing the uptake of calcium and decreasing the relaxation time. This is known as positive lucitropic effect and inotropic effect. So increased influx of calcium to the sarcolemma, increased release of calcium by the sarcoplasmic reticulum and positive lucitropic effect by increasing activity of phospholambar will increase the myocardial contractility. So increased influx of calcium into the cardiac myocyte increases the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is also known as calcium-induced calcium release. And increased ionic calcium, increased calcium in the cardiac myocyte enhances myocardial contractility. Increased reuptake of calcium decreases the relaxation time, which is positive lucitropic effect. Uh, stress in the office makes the heart work harder. Why does this occur? So we have now studied the effect of preload and myocardial contractility on stroke volume, that is the heart as a pump. Now we'll study a third scenario, that is the effect of afterload of peripheral resistance. So when a person is stressed, say in the office, then that increases the sympathetic nerve system and that enhances the release of norepinephrine from the postganglionic sympathetic nerve endings and which increases the peripheral vascular resistance. 
the peripheral vascular resistance is the afterload. This is by the formula R is equal to 8NL delta P pi R is to 4. The pi is missing here. And when there is atherosclerosis collection, that is fatty coronary arteries due to lipid deposition, then what will happen? Peripheral resistance increases because the vessel radius affects the peripheral resistance. You can see this is the coat of endothelium lining the blood vessels. And when blood is flowing uh, through these vessels, uh, this blood will, this endothelium will exert a friction and that will increase the peripheral resistance. Now, if this endothelium becomes, uh, the endothelial lining remains the same, but if the vessel radius becomes less, then the effect of this coating layer becomes more and more friction is exerted and that will increase the peripheral resistance. So lowering of the vessel radius increases the peripheral resistance. So if the vessel radius is lowered, the peripheral resistance is increased, the afterload is increased, there will be damming of blood in the uh, uh, proximal to this uh, uh, obstruction and the heart will have to pump more and more. So the blood pressure will increase. The heart has to work more, the blood pressure has to increase. So now you can, another thing is the increased RBC count because RBCs are 7.2 to 7.8 micrometers in diameter while the capillary is just 5 micrometers in uh, diameter. So the RBCs have to assume a parachute-like configuration while passing through the vessels and when the number increases, the friction resistance and the peripheral resistance increases. So this increase resistance increases in polycythemia. So dilation of the arterioles allows more blood to flow from the arterial to the venous system and this will decrease the arterial blood pressure. So if the arterial blood pressure on the other hand decreases, then the stroke volume and hence the cardiac output will increase. On the other hand, if the peripheral resistance increases due to stress, atherosclerosis, or if it increases due to increase in the number of RBCs as in a pathological condition like polycythemia, where are then the cardiac output will on the other hand, decrease. So you can name the two factors affecting peripheral resistance. Which are they? One is the radius of the blood vessel, which is the other factor. Yes, the other factor is the viscosity of blood which is determined by the RBC count. And what would you say to your friend? So I'm summarizing, that is the preload is affected by the venous return, the atrial pump activity and ventricular compliance. The venous return in turn is affected by the skeletal muscle pump, thoracic and abdominal pump and extracellular fluid volume. Please remember that the main determinant of myocardial contractility is ventricular muscle mass and increases by physical conditioning. And it decreases if there is a myocardial infarct or a heart attack. Sympathetic nervous system increases myocardial contractility by increasing calcium influx. Please remember that the heart muscle requires increased calcium inside it to pump more forcefully and also increases calcium uptake through a molecule called phospholamban which is known as positive leucotropic effect and after load is affected mainly by the total peripheral resistance which in turn is affected by the mainly by the vessel radius so thank you this completes the lecture on determinants of stroke volume